Well, things got fairly chilly across much of the upper Midwest and Northern Plains over the weekend. Did we do some frost damage potentially? That is one topic of discussion we have for this week's weekly weather update. Joining us now for a conversation, Eric Snodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions. Eric, good to have you back with us. Hope you had a nice weekend and let's start there. Frost, we got some pretty chilly temperatures that it kind of felt late fall like across parts of the northern plains in the upper midwest here over the weekend what have you heard what did you see did we potentially have some frost damage out there you know i'm mostly concerned about the soybeans um if you're in the red river valley if your beans are like r5 r6 i mean we, we could have substantial loss now if you're an r7 you're a bit you're a bit farther along and tend to resist more of the damage but we saw that in the Red River Valley of the North, and then we saw some patchy frost in Wisconsin. There was even a corner of Iowa that I still think may have had it last night. Uh, and as a result, we've got um, we've got a question as to whether or not this took the even more of the top end off of where the crop has been. The other side of it is with the drop, but we'll get back to that in a minute. What's crazy about these temperatures is what, what did we talk about all summer? It was like, well, how many nights over 70 have we had? And, you know, where, where do the ranks sit with the heat during the day? And again, during the night in the really hot, humid conditions. And then we just turned it off. So if you think about this, this is crazy. While the West has had record heat since about August 20th, I mean, massive fires in California still going today. We've had multiple, multiple weeks of fires in Washington, Oregon, uh, British Columbia, spreading smoke across the country. And that incredible, you know, just incredible amount of heat that's been in the West, um, you know, we've been seeing the opposite. So where I live here, and I mean, I'm in a jacket, you can see that this morning, mm -hmm. where I am in central Illinois, we just had our coldest last 10 days of August, first eight days of September. So that, that time range on record, going back to 1893. Now, we didn't get a frost here. So it wasn't like 1974 where there was a massive Arctic outbreak that hit and gave us a frost, but it's been so chilly day in and day out. And so what kills me is I was having to tell friends and family yesterday, they're like, well, you know, how do things look for the rest of the month? I'm like, we might touch a hundred. And they're like, what do you, I said, yeah, there is, there is a pronounced ridge building back into the central part of North America. And there are chances that we'll go deep into the nineties with heat index values approaching a hundred uh, for Illinois, Missouri, maybe parts of Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, and it's going to crank. The heat's going to crank. And so this frost will all of a sudden become a, a distant memory unless you had a crop that was damaged by it. And wow, what a wild finish uh, to the growing season to see such huge range in temperatures to show up, you know, when they're typically not around like this, right? You know, we usually like through Labor Day and beyond, it's like, oh, it's just hot. And then we start talking about frost. Oh, is it going to be nearly frost in the third week of September, right? Not this year. It's all early. Well, and thinking about that, okay, getting a warm up here as we get through the back half of September and harvest season, and some producers maybe want to see a little more heat to finish things off. But you mentioned drought earlier, and yeah. that's the other piece of this. We're going to warm it up. But are we going to see any sort of moisture out there, Eric? You know, I was teased a little bit by the models this morning. Not, I mean, not not this week, but like next weekend. They were trying to drive some thunderstorms out of like Wisconsin into Illinois, Indiana and East. And I'm just saying you whenever you're in drought and you see a model try to do that, that the thinking is like drought begets drought. Like don't count on those thunderstorms coming through. So what it says, honestly, is that if you look from like Texas through Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, parts of Oklahoma, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, India, that whole stretch all the way into the Northeast, there are chances that they could continue a dry streak. And I've got a few spots in that window there. Okay. If you can just geographically picture that there's a few spots where we're measuring over 45 days since they've measured anything in terms of rainfall. And, you know, you and I, good friend, Matt Bennett, Matt's like, we're going to start cutting this week. Like it's, it's just it dried enough in the field. We're going to go out and see, he goes, I'm worried that the heat took um, some off the top end. And then the drought at the very end took the top end off. He's worried about his yields. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's in Southern Illinois or South Central Illinois. And, uh, you know, I, I get it. It's, it's, it's been a very, very rough finish to the season in terms of the way the temperature flip flop and this drought. And so, you put it all together and say, well, the major rivers, which are supposed to drain all this out, you know, where's the Mississippi right now in Memphis? It's nearly four feet below low stage. 
A year ago right now, it was seven feet below low stage, and we just didn't pick up any precip through the rest of September and October. No hurricane to come through and revive it. Um, and so it's it's a it's a pretty serious situation to finish the year, Jesse. And I, I I was I'll be honest, I was kind of hoping we would just coast to a finish. We would focus on South America. And instead, these weather issues for the United States need to be paid attention to very carefully. Very true. Well, and we'll talk South America in a second. How about the tropics as you look at things there, as we start thinking about the second half of the season? A anything showing up there, Eric? Well, yes, but it's not quite yet. It's going to be another eight to 10 days from now. We'll finally have something to talk about. The lid is coming off of the tropics, so it's been just suppressed for weeks. Most forecasts have been very consistent. They're going to take that lid off. Um, that's all about the movement of the MJO and that kind of stuff. Well, anyway. Second half of the season starts in seven days. And so we still have another 45 days to go through the hurricane season. And some of the models are beginning to tease that there's a bit more of a, a shakeup going on in the tropical Atlantic that could start to stir up some systems. But to be honest with you, Jesse, what drove the drought in the central U.S.? Well, it's the fact the Bermuda High left. It's over by the Azores, almost to Africa. So Aaron, uh, Fernand, both hurricanes missed. They went up the, you know, they missed the East Coast. They, they turned north because of the position of the Bermuda High. So if we want to, if we really want to stop this drought, unfortunately, in fall, droughts never just end with a couple of nice weekends of rainfall. It's remnants of a hurricane, return of the Bermuda High. It seems to be that fall is always a season of precipitation extremes. So we have to be careful what we wish for. The other side of the tropics is what's going on with Hawaii. I don't know if you're sure if you saw this, but there's Hurricane Kiko. Uh, that's going north of Hawaii. At this point, thankfully, the, it looks as though it's going to miss the islands. Um, and by the way, don't think that we don't do a ton of ag in Hawaii. There's a lot of research trials. There's a lot of seed genetics that are developed there. So it's it's detrimental when they have very, very adverse weather. I think Kiko's going to miss. But the Pacific may become quite alive as we get into September and October. And those systems that leave Japan sometimes get absorbed into the jet stream flow and can really be disruptive to um, you know, North American weather downstream. So, Jesse, I don't think this is going to be a fall where we just sit on our hands and find wide open windows to do things. I think we're either going to be battling too dry conditions, which makes me think like, oh, bearing fires and combines. Or mm -hmm. we're going to have a problem where if the pattern flips, now it's like, when do I get this crop out? What's the stand quality going to be if we get really, really wet? So I, I, I hate to put some anxiety into the fall forecast, but I don't like it the way it currently stands. We're going to be tracking this very closely. It's going to be an important couple of weeks ahead. How about South America? An important couple of weeks ahead for them as well as they start to ramp up spring planting season, Eric. It's crazy. I mean, the most important thing about South America is where are they in terms of planting progress by November 1? Okay, so that's that's 50 days from now or, or roughly 50 days from now. Um, here's what I think I see. It's a pick your poison kind of deal with the forecast. If it's supportive for your ideas for Brazil to be dry early, oh, go look at the GFS. It's bone dry. Just nothing coming into the Cerrado. If you are like, man, we need to get some rain in there and, and we got to get them going fast. Well, then just use the ECMWF. It's really wet. And you're like, well, which one's right, Eric? And I'm like, neither. Neither is right. Why are they so polar opposite of one another is a bit of a mystery, honestly. I think each is misinterpreting the signals in the South Atlantic and over where we have the MJO moving around. And so what I'm going to wait on is, will we get this big dome of high pressure to live just off the East Coast to pump the moisture in the northern side of it that would start the monsoon? It's not there yet. So where is all the, the flow? It's down in southern Brazil. It's in northern Argentina. It's in Paraguay and Uruguay, where they're getting a tremendous amount of late winter, early spring rainfall. And it's been problematic for those areas. Now, that being said, I'll come back to the first statement. Where are they by November 1? So there's going to be a lot of chatter about this early September planting, but that's not, the chatter's misplaced. It's how they're doing in October and how they're doing to finish October. That's going to be most critical. So we've got plenty to watch there, but it's always the monsoon comes in and fits and starts. It never just goes, oh, come on, let's go. Uh, the big thing is I get worried more about longer term trends. If you just said, well, Eric, what, what typically happens in October? Well, Normally they plant a lot of crop in October, but the longer term trend is drier by two inches over the last 45 years in the Cerrado in uh, October. So they're going to be asking those questions as well, just as they get into the fields and get going. Eric, anything else you would add or reiterate to folks here this week? 
Sure. You're going to hear everybody because it's late summer giving you their best you know, forecast for, for winter. A lot of it's going to be based off of uh, La Nina, which we do have a La Nina building that every La Nina has a different flavor. But I'm just going to tell you what every model is going to say. Wet Pacific Northwest, super active Ohio Valley storm track that gets into the Northeast. And then drought in our Sun Belt and Cotton Belt. That, that's what that's lining it to the T. So any forecast is going to go look at those things and go, yep, that's what we should expect this winter. Just remember that when that stuff comes across your Facebook feed or, you know, you see it on Twitter or TikTok. If we really know, we're not posting it to Facebook, right? So <laughs> it's one of those things where just understand there's a lot of, of variability coming this winter and nothing's set in stone yet. But La Nina will be a major factor, so I'll be watching it. Agweather.com for more, ag-wx.com. Eric Stodgrass, Nutrient Ag Solutions. Thanks again for joining us this week, Eric. We appreciate it. You bet.